The first question I want to put to you is, what are we celebrating? Anyone know? Well, there we are. As, as we're not face to face, I better answer my own silly question. Uh, it probably seems a silly question. Obviously, we are celebrating Christmas, aren't we? Uh, and what is Christmas precisely? I think it's supposed to be something to do with the birth of Jesus Christ, isn't it? So, I, so I'm so I'm reliably informed. Now, here's a, here's a, here's a fir the first the second question. What does the Bible say about the date of the birth of Jesus Christ? Anyone know? I will tell you. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing whatsoever in the Bible or anywhere else that indicates when Jesus was supposed to have been born. Um, the early Christians used to celebrate, actually used to celebrate uh, Christmas on the 7th of January. I don't know if you know that. And I don't know if you know that the Russian Orthodox Church still celebrates Christmas on the 7th of January. I speak fairly good Russian, but I don't know what, I do not know what the Russian for Happy Christmas is. I never heard it. They don't say Happy Christmas. They say Happy New Year, yes, but they don't celebrate Christmas much anyway. It's mainly Easter. Is this it. But yeah, the 7th of January was the traditional date. The only problem was that uh, nobody else joined in the celebrations. <laughs> you weren't interested. Everyone else was far more interested in, guess what, the 25th of December. Now, what's the 25th of December? Certainly nothing to do with Christianity. It's entirely a pagan festival. And if you think about it, if you think about it for a moment, everything you can mention related to, to the traditions of our Christmas is of a pagan origin. Let's say an example, Father Christmas. You know, the guy with the red robes who goes around giving presents and saying, ho, 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 he, 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 whatever he says. Uh, who is this guy? It's true the Christians have slapped a, a saint's name on it. They call him Saint Nicholas because Saint Nicholas, I think, is supposed to be the patron saints of giving gifts at all to children or something like that. Nothing to do with it. It's obviously a pagan god that's uh, interfering, climbing down people's chimneys for reasons best known to to himself and then there's things like uh, the mistletoe you know I don't, it's not much in fashion these days the mistletoe it used to be when i was your age mistletoe was very important because you buy a sprig of mistletoe have you ever seen a mistletoe, mistletoe plant hands up all, all those who've seen the mistletoe plant ah there's one or two lost souls who've seen the mistletoe and what does it look like this? Well, it's a green plant. It's actually a parasite. Did you know that? It's a parasite. It doesn't have any existence of its own. It lives off trees, mainly the oak tree, which was a sacred tree to the ancient Celts. And it's berries. It's got little berries, little, little white berries that closely resemble the sun. And that's the point. The ancient Celts thought that the mistletoe was a mysterious plant because it didn't have any roots of its own that it was th and a thunderstorm would come and the lightning would hit the oak tree and that would produce mistletoe and the little balls were representations of the sun now in my young day mistletoe was very important christmas day because if you if you weren't particularly good looking i was of course but if you were particularly good looking young chap and you wanted to kiss a young lady of your choice you carry a sprig of mistletoe you hold it up in the air and if, if she was caught under the mistletoe, she'd have to give you a kiss. Isn't that fun? Isn't that? Uh, it's a bit tame these days, you know, but there we are. But mind you, in the old days, it wasn't so tame because this is a fertility symbol. And therefore, one assumes that the ancient guys had much more fun under the mistletoe than whatever we, did, we dreamt of when I was a young man. You know, it was, just, it was a fun thing. Mistletoe. Or the Christmas tree brought to this country, apparently, by Prince Albert, Queen Queen Victoria's uh, hubby from Germany. Well, of course, the, the, the tree was traditionally, the trees was where the ancient Celts and Germans celebrated their pagan ceremonies. They didn't have churches, buildings, they celebrated it in groves, <coughs> sacred groves, <coughs> mainly the oak tree, which is where the mistletoe comes in. So that's a, that's a pagan thing. The yule log, again, you don't see that anymore, except perhaps when you buy a chocolate Yule log in, in, in Tesco's or whatever. Now the Yule log, Yule is an old word, old Germanic word for, um, 
for Christmas, actually. In Sweden, it's still Yule. God Yule is happy Christmas in Sweden. Nicholas will confirm what I said. The Yule log, uh, and Jonathan, of course, I think he's there somewhere. Uh, the Yule log is, is, is a Christmas thing. It, it, you put, you'd put a log on the fire and build up the fire on the lot of because there used to be bonfires Christmas time. That was typical of all these festivals. They'd build a fire to encourage the sun to come back. These are agricultural peoples, of course, and the comings and goings of the, sea, the seasons and the sun, of course, was of fundamental importance. So they wanted to encourage the sun by creating bonfires, hence the Yule log, and so on. And many other examples. They're all pagan. As in, and of course, what you're talk, what you're celebrating actually on the 25th of December is the winter solstice. That's all. It's a barrel of fun. So those of you, those of you like myself, who are atheists, although there's a difference. You know, my wife is also an atheist, but she's a Catholic atheist. I'm a Protestant atheist. There's a difference. But there you are. I won't go into that. It's too complicated. But there we are. So um, those who are atheists and feel a little bit guilty about celebrating Christmas, don't feel guilty, my friends, because you're not celebrating anything Christian, you know. It's the good old winter solstice. Yeah, it's an ancient festival. It used to be called the Saturnalia in Roman times. It was a bundle of fun, you know. And all of the, all of the uh, Christian festivals are pagan in origin. Every single one of them. Easter, for example. You know where the word Easter comes from? It's from the Germanic goddess. I think she was the goddess of love, like Aphrodite. Eostre. Eostre. Yeah, and that was traditionally celebrated in the old days with human sacrifice to encourage the crops to grow, which is, it's, which is probably the origin of the idea of the crucifixion and rose again on the third day and so on and so forth. All this, uh, all this, all this stuff. So the pagan elements there are very, very clear, very, very, very clear indeed. Bethlehem, there we are. You know, the star of Bethlehem and the three kings or the three, three wise men, as they, they, they correctly call it in the Bible. Who are these guys? Well, Bethlehem actually was the cult center of Ishtar, which is the pagan goddess in the Middle East. We had different names, Ishtar, Astarte, or Aphrodite, to give its Greek name, goddess of love, goddess of fertility. And of course, she had a, a star, the star of Bethlehem, naturally, is uh, Venus, which is, which is worshipped by uh, the followers of Ishtar and Aphrodite, that's all. And the three wise men that came, guided by this pagan star to a pagan cult center, Three wise men, or three, three magi they're often called, or magi they're called, which, which are um, pagan priests, Persian priests actually, Zoroastrian priests, I think they were fire worshippers actually. So all these elements that have come into Christianity, they're nothing whatsoever to do with Christianity. Nothing, zero, zero there's nothing in the Christian uh, myth that you can trace uh, or make anything sense of. Actually, th this time of year, you'd know this if you know any peasant countries, like I know Spain quite well. It's the time of year where the peasants traditionally kill their animals. They kill the pig, for example. Not so in uh, ancient Judea, of course, because that was an unclean animal, but they've killed their animals and, 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 and salt the meat and so on, and feast and make pigs of themselves, to use that expression before the, the, hard, the lean days of winter would set in, where they'd probably go a bit hungry for a while. So that's the origin of this. There is no other origin. It's precisely the, uh, <laughs> the celebration of, of the solstice. Now, we don't know when Jesus was born. We don't really know when he died or if he died or, or if he existed as a matter of fact. And that's the point. As a matter of fact, you know, there is actually no historical evidence whatsoever for the existence of Jesus Christ. The name Jesus Christ mean, tells us nothing. Jesus is a common Jewish name, same as Joshua, actually. And Christ just means the Christ, the Messiah. That's all. That tells you nothing. And this subject was dealt with in, in marvelous detail in, in a wonderful book, which I recommend you to read over a hundred years ago, written by Karl Kautsky, who at that time was still a prominent Marxist. He deviated later on, but that's another matter. <laughs> a book called The Foundations of Christianity. 
there you'll find a very a very detailed analysis of the whole question and a very good sound materialist uh, Marxist explanation of it. But you see, if we're going to look for the uh, some kind of explanation of uh, of uh, this question, we should look first of all, obviously, into the non-Christian sources. That's the obvious place to look. And here you must remember something. I think people tend to forget this. People tend to forget this definitely. That they tend to forget the fact we are not dealing here with the Dark Ages. You know, the period under consideration which we're dealing with here is the height of the Roman Empire. That's what it was. And that was a, was a highly literate world with a wealth of literary sources dealing with all kinds of things, including history. Now, according to the Bible, if you read the Bible, this was a most extraordinary period, whichever way you look at it, for goodness sake. The blind saw, the lame walked, even the dead were raised, and huge multitudes of people gathered all over Judea to listen to what would be considered by the Romans to be subversive speeches. And since Judea at that time, by the way, was a province of the Roman Empire, no less, one might expect that there be some reports, some record of these, of these developments in the written, written records. But when, when we come to consider the Roman sources, and there are many of them, many prominent historians were, were dealing with this period, we can find only out of the whole vast uh, gamut of sources, we can only find a couple of references uh, in Tacitus and Pliny, fundamentally, which deal not with uh, Jesus Christ, but with the existence of the Christians. Now, there's no, no, no question whatsoever that the Christians, we know that the Christians exist, and that's, that's a certain fact. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about the, the physical existence of the founder of Christianity, the person of Jesus Christ. And these references I'm referring to, the Tacitus and Pliny, contain no mention whatsoever of any details about the life of Jesus Christ, none. Yes, but, now this is interesting. There is one other reference, which is of crucial importance, not by a Roman writer, but by a contemporary source, if by, by a Jewish historian, no less. Oh yes, a very famous Jewish historian. I refer to Flavius Josephus, a famous author, who wrote a detailed history, a very detailed history of the Jews and of Judea at that time, as a matter of fact. Now, in one of his works, which I have on one of the shelves behind me, one of his works called The Antiquities of the Jews or the Jewish Antiquities, whichever you like, there's a whole chapter that deals with Pontius Pilate. Have you heard of Pontius Pilate? I hope so. Must have read the Bible to some extent. Uh, he was, um, he most certainly did exist. Oh, no, no two ways about that. And a real bastard he was, by all accounts. Pontius Pilate was none other than the Roman governor of Judea at the time when Christ was supposed to exist. As a matter of fact, according to the Bible, he was the man that presided over the trial of Jesus that led to his crucifixion. Okay, so there's no question that Pontius Pilate existed. And there's a whole chapter in, uh, in Josephus' book on, on Pontius Pilate. And in this chapter, we read the following. I will read it. Here it is. It's in front of me. About this time, there lived Jesus. Got that? About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed it be lawful to call him a man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people who accepted the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ. That you will read in Joseph. Oh yes, you'll read it okay. Now, this statement appears as an isolated paragraph. There's no further elaboration either before or after it. Now this is strange, very strange indeed, considering the obvious importance of the statement itself. Here is a Jewish author 
saying that Jesus Christ not only existed, but he was the Christ. That's to say, he was the Messiah. Now you see, this is a puzzle, isn't it? It is a puzzle. It seems contradictory. It is contradictory. It is a puzzle. Yeah, but this puzzle is easily resolved. For the simple reason, my friends, that it is physically impossible that Flavius Josephus could have written these lines or anything remotely resembling that. We know uh, all about, we know a lot about the life of uh, Flavius, not much about the life of Jesus. We know plenty about the life of, of Flavius Josephus. He, he wrote his own memoirs, so we know about it. And we know that, that he was a Pharisee, that is to say, a member of an ultra orthodox, an ultra orthodox Jewish sect. And for him to admit that Jesus was in fact the Christ, that is to say the Messiah, would be the worst kind of blasphemy that one could possibly imagine. Now, in fact, this is a self-evident forgery. Oh yes, there's plenty of forgeries in those days, not just in our times. Evident, you see, these, these, in those days, of course, the books had to be copied by hand. Manuscripts, manuscripts were copied by hand. And sometime later, it's obvious what happened, that some Christian monk copying out this text suddenly decided the absence of any reference to Jesus Christ was highly undesirable. And therefore, logically, decided to insert the, for, the aforementioned passage. And now, there is no other explanation, and unless, of course, you argue, some people have argued, oh yes, but the thing is that because he was a Jew and therefore hostile to Christianity, that's the reason why he didn't mention Jesus Christ. Not so. Not so, that doesn't stand the least examination, because in the same text, we find many references to individuals <coughs> which um, Flavius Joseph polemicizes against and who he describes as false prophets. For example, there's actually a Judas of Galilee, not Jesus of Galilee. He mentions a Judas of Galilee, among others, but no Jesus. Now, clearly, the existence of this figure, Jesus, Jesus of Galilee or Nazareth, was completely unknown to Flavius Josephus. There's no other explanation. So, where do we stand? <coughs> well, as far as the literary sources are concerned, we are now thrown back to the only so possible sources available, <coughs> and these are the four Gospels. Yeah? I, I take it you've all read the Bible, haven't you? Raise your hand, those who have read the Bible. <coughs> Nobody, aren't you ashamed of yourselves? I recommend you to read the Bible. It's a very interesting book, full of wisdom. I'm speaking not without any irony at all. Full of, full of wisdom and poetry, and interesting stuff. I'm a bit disappointed by the ending, however. The world goes up in flames and all the rest. I didn't fancy that, but the rest of it is okay. Anyway, back to the four Gospels. Now, who wrote these four Gospels? Anyone know? <coughs> Anyone know the, the, who wrote the four Gospels? Come on, somebody must know. Silence as of the grave. I'll answer the question. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surely you must all know that, of course. And who were they? Who was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, most people would say without hesitation that these are the disciples of Christ, who undoubtedly had the same names. Yes. People would say that, and it is completely false. It is wrong. The people who wrote the Gospels were not the disciples at all. These works were written a very long time after Christ was supposed to have lived and died. The scholarly consensus is that they were the work of unknown Christians and were composed approximately 68, from 68 AD, to 110 AD, or CS, as they call it these days, don't mind what it is, you know what I mean. In other words, they were composed many decades after Christ was supposed to have died. And yeah, and of course, at the time, there was no uh, computers, no smartphones, no uh, shorthand as far as I'm aware. And yet, and yet, these Gospels composed many decades, even, even almost 100 years after Christ was supposed to have died claim to report speeches made at mass gatherings, and gathering, we know how difficult it is to hear people in, in mass gatherings of any sort, many, many years later. Moreover, and this is interesting, 
the Gospels contradict each other frequently. And as a matter of fact, even these contradictions, the contradictions themselves are quite interesting. Let me take one of the most famous examples, from one of the most famous speeches of all, the Sermon on the Mount. If you've heard of that, of course, the Sermon on the Mount. And the Beatitudes. Surely all of you know the Beatitudes. No? Everyone knows the Beatitudes. Or at least they say, you know, blessed be the, etc. Uh, everyone knows the Beatitudes, or at least think they, they think they know them. They think they know them. But if we compare two versions of, of the same speech, Matthew and Luke, we'll find very striking differences between the two. Let's start with Matthew. I quote, And seeing the multitudes, imagine thousands of people, eh? Thou, imagine speaking without a microphone, <laughs> thousands of people, and they're going to hear you at the back, I suppose. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, here we go, listen carefully to the words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, you've heard that surely, a thousand times. Blessed be the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I draw your attention to the fact that a rich man can be poor in spirit. Donald Trump can be poor in spirit. You know, the owner of Amazon can be poor in spirit. He can be a billionaire. But let's go back. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Ah, listen to this one. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. <clears throat> Anyone can hunger and thirst. A rich man can hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after, after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now then, let's compare this for a moment with Luke. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, not poor in spirit, not at all. Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, says Luke. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be fed. Hunger, your belly's empty, not hunger and thirst after righteousness at all. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and, and leap for, for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. And in the, like in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. And Luke goes on. He goes on. Listen to this. But woe unto you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe unto you, and when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers unto the false prophets. Now then, that's fiery stuff, isn't it? Not one word of that is in Matthew. Not a single word. So here you've got two totally different versions of what may have been the same speech. Now this is a class question, my friends, very clearly. The revolutionary message, class message contained in Luke, has been entirely eradicated by the revisionist Matthew. And this is typical of, the, of the, the Bible as a whole, as it has come down to us in a truncated version. And this is no accident. Now, if you read my history of philosophy, which I hope you have, I've dealt with this, the, count, the Council of Nicaea, I'll deal with that in a moment, and how the gangster, the Emperor Constantine, co-opted the bishops of the church by surrounding the building with, with troops, not allowing any food and drink in until they, they signed on the dotted line and signed up to a particular version of the, of the Gospels, excluding every other version. There were many verses, many, many, many versions of the Gospels were in circulation and they were trimmed down and some were excluded. And the book of Revelation of St. John, which is probably certainly the oldest and the most reliable of, of all the Christian documents that have come down to us, it only just made it, I don't know, by, 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 by a fluke it got into the Bible, otherwise it wouldn't be there. A lot of others were excluded. Now you see, this is no accident. The early Christians, what I'm implying, 
is that the early Christians started out as a revolutionary movement of the poor, Jewish in the first instance, of course. Now, in order to understand this, I, I think we've, 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 you can study the Bible as much as you like, and I've looked at it quite a lot. You won't, you won't get to the bottom of this. In order to really understand it, you have to leave these things to one side, because the Bible also is not history, by the way. It is not. You might get some ideas, but it's not, not genuine history. In order to understand this, you've got to adopt the standpoint of historical materialism. That is to say, you must start by understanding the material conditions that existed in Judea at that time. Now, in the past, previously at one time, Judea was a wealthy province, and the wealth of Judea depended on it fundamentally on its geographical position, which was at the intersection of important trade routes, land routes to the east. That was important. But the development of sea trade, particularly by the Greeks, undermined that position. And by the time we are considering, Judea was no longer a wealthy place. On the contrary, it was reduced to the state of an impoverished out outpost of the Roman Empire. And it's no accident if you read the Gospels, which I think you should, it's no accident the picture, that, the picture of society that emerges from the Gospels is one of unrelief, poverty, and suffering of the masses. And that's of fundamental importance to understand. But of course, as always in any society, there are rich and poor. There were rich and, and poor at that. There was colossal inequality, as I will deal with in a, a moment. And the class struggle in Judea had a particularly sharp character where violent uh, uprisings were common occurrences. It drove the Ro Romans crazy. They, they, they weren't very fond of uh, Judea at all. And given the history and traditions of the Jewish people, it comes as, as no surprise that these uprisings usually took on a, a religious coloring, of course. And different religious movements, it's important that we understand this, this is the case often in history, in ancient history, and medieval history, even, and that different re religious movements and sects play the roles, or have played the roles, similar to political parties at the present time, and they are divided on class lines. Let's have a look at the, the, the divisions in society of, in Judea at the time we're referring to. At the apex of society, the top of society, they, took, they stood the sect known as the Sadducees. They mentioned in the Bible. This is the priest caste. Now, amidst this sea of poverty and suffering and, and hunger, you know, there was one exception, and that was the Temple of Jerusalem. Now, when I refer to the Temple of Jerusalem, you mustn't think it shows us in, in terms of Westminster Abbey or anything like that. It wasn't a single building. It was a whole complex, a vast area in, in Jerusalem. And it was a wealthy area, full of money, full of loot, mainly derived from donations, from devout pilgrims who came there, and the Jewish diaspora, which was very successful in trade in Rome and Antioch and Alexandria and other cities. You know? so, so a lot of money was flooding into the, uh, the temple. And of course, this was held by the, the Sadducees. These guys also were collaborators. Don't forget, this was a Roman colony, in effect. The Sadducees actively collaborated with the Roman authorities. They were traitors, traitors to, the, to their nation. The Sadducees, the priests, frequently adopted, and they caused a scandal in, among the Jewish society. They adopted Jewish, Greek names, rather, Greek names and Greek dress. And they were looked at uh, with suspicion and hatred by everybody, but particularly by the next sect, which I want to mention. I've mentioned them already. The Pharisees. Now, these were, these were a class, of, to, 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 it's class basis, so mainly wealthy people, wealthy merchants and people of the middling class, if you like, who ostentatiously maintained a rigid adherence to the traditional Jewish customs and religion in protest against the Romans and against the Sadducees. You could compare them, I suppose, to modern day bourgeois nationalists in colonial countries. Or why not even to, um, what's his name, the leader of the Labour Party, what's he called? Starmer, isn't it, I think? You know, there's these kind of people, you know. 
they were opposed to Roman rule and to the domination of the Sadducees, but, the, the, but their opposition was always tinged with fear, fear of the masses. They were always looking over their shoulders at the, at the masses. And it's interesting, if you read the Bible again, Jesus Christ always speaks of the Pharisees with the, the utmost, the most profound contempt. He described them as uh, the generation of vipers. That's a good one, isn't it? The generation of vipers, poisonous snakes, and uh, whited sepulchres. You know, sepulchre is a tomb, a tomb which is painted white on the inside. It looks very nice on the white, but inside it's full of rotting corpses and decay and stench and corruption. White is kept sepulchers. That's how Christ is, is described. The Pharisees. Now, a typical, as I've mentioned before, a typical representative of this class was precisely Flavius Josephus, the historian I mentioned earlier. Now, he uh, originally, there was a huge, tremendous, many revolts, but these revolts culminated in the great Jewish revolt of 66 AD or CE, it's called these days. He participated in this uprising. Oh, yes. But he soon realized that they, <laughs> they weren't going to succeed. And he betrayed his people, of course, and went over to the side of the Romans. This is ca entirely characteristic of the Pharisees, the generation of vipers and the whited sepulchres that Christ referred to. He supported the Romans, who then inflicted a terrible, bloody defeat on the Jews, a terrible thing, culminating in 70 CE, 1780, with the total destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, an act of revenge on the Romans' part. Terrible. Destruction took place. Now, this is very significant because, and I think it's significant for the Christians, for the origins of the Christians, because up until that point, the Jewish people had been had relied on, on, on revolt, violence, mutiny. When they talk about a new Jerusalem, they weren't talking about a new Jerusalem in the clouds, they were talking about taking possession of the Temple of Jerusalem in Jerusalem and reorganizing society on different lines. But with the terrible defeat, it was ghastly slaughter, terrible, indescribable massacre took place. And the, the wholesale destruction of the temple by Titus, the son of Ves the emperor Vespasian. Uh, this colored the whole attitude of the people. I think the, the, the whole mood of society after this was a mood of intense, profound depression uh, pessimism, defeatism, and so on. And in this situation, people tend to turn inwards on themselves. And therefore, the struggle was no longer a struggle as it had been, a revolutionary struggle to change society, but more or less waiting for emancipation in the form of the second coming of the Messiah and uh, a kingdom in, in heaven, not on earth. They gave up all hope, in other words. And that was reflected in, in, in the Christians. But let's let's go back to the political parties I haven't finished. Because there was another party, we go further to the left, a party of the streets known as the Zealots. You know what a zealot is? It's passed in, in, into our language. The Zealots was, was a movement rep representing the most downtrodden sections of, of the masses. The lumpen proletariat, I suppose you could call them. Always ready to stage riots and uprisings, always. And it, what's interesting is that one of the disciples, this is not, this escapes most people's attention, but it didn't escape my attention. One of Christ's disciples, James, his name was, was known as, it was described as James the Zealot. So there's a member of this party, if you like, in the ranks of Jesus' disciples. Now that's, that's significant. But you see, in addition to this, there was another party of the poor, of the dispossessed masses, about, about which until recently, very little was known. It was a, a sect called the Essenes. Kowski, Karl Kowski, in his book, The Foundations of Christianity, he showed, showed his genius, actually, <clears throat> was of the opinion that the early Christians were really an, an offshoot of this movement, the, the Essenes. I think that's probably correct, by the way. But when Kowski wrote this, the only sources available were the Roman sources. And even they were quite favorable towards the Essenes in the sense that they described them as very honest and courageous people. 
But the, nobody ever thought that any, any written sources would ever be found. Certainly not in Kautsky's day. Yes, but they've been found against all the odds. In the late 1940s, 1947, I believe, in a cave near the Dead Sea, uh, Arab Bedouin uh, tribes who discovered the scrolls, ancient scrolls, which took a long time to decipher. These are, these are the famous Dead Sea scrolls. And these scrolls are precisely the scrolls of the Essenes, which everyone thought had disappeared, been destroyed, massacred by the Romans. Yeah, they, 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 they survived against all the odds because of the very dry conditions in a cave in the desert. And these scrolls, it's, it's taken them a long time to, to piece them together and to, to, to translate them. But it's clear that this was a Jewish sect, or if they were a Jewish sect, okay. But in all their rituals and belief, they were very similar to the early Christians. Also, they were communists. They believed in sharing the, you know, didn't believe in private property. This was, uh, by the way, these Dead Sea Scrolls, I remember when I was at school, every Sunday on the God slot, they'd have some priest on, and he'd be talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls very excitedly. They hadn't yet deciphered them. But then all of a sudden, it went, went, they went quiet. Silence, stum, nothing. Not surprising, because the Dead Sea Scrolls were, were very similar to the Christians, it's true. They were carbon dated, and I think the, the, the date they came up with is about 140 BC. <laughs> so how does that show the existence of Christ? It shows that the Christian movement existed before Christ. How could that be? And these scrolls actually were kidnapped, you know? You know where they ended up? The Vatican stole the lot. It took the lot. The uh, Israelis weren't very happy because they said, well, this is our stuff. This is, uh, of this. They stole the lot. And they kept it hidden for about 40 years. Can you imagine that? Refusing all access of, of archaeologists and, uh, and the Israeli authorities and so on. Until finally some yank, of course, inevitably hacked into their computer and, and released the lot. And that caused a furore, which is still continuing. I don't want to enter into that. <clears throat> but just to say that it, it does tend to bear out everything that Kowski wrote. That the Christians were really an offshoot of this Essene movement. They were a mass movement of the poorest and most downtrodden section of society. And uh, it's, it's not an accident, by the way, that the Romans, they, they began to spread, eventually they began to spread beyond the Jews and they began to win over uh, also foreigners. Greeks and uh, Romans and so on, particularly after they decided to abolish the Jewish delightful customs, which involves a very painful operation for males. I think you know what I'm referring to. You get a little bit excise from your private parts, which is not a very, and then all kinds of other poor business, can't eat pork, can't do this, can't do that. Christians did away with, with those things. Anyway, to come back to my, my story, it's not an accident that the Romans referred to the Christians in a contemptuous manner as being a movement of slaves and women. Slaves and women, by the way, were in quite a similar legal position. They had no rights. And it's true. Christians did appeal to women and to slaves. And the movement took off. It took off like, uh, like wildfire. Engels actually wrote that the, there are many parallels, and he's right actually, there are many parallels between the early Christian movement and the modern proletariat. And the early Christians definitely took, took the side of the poor and rich against the, the, the poor and, and, and the poor and downtrodden against the rich and powerful. The Bible itself, you read the, the Gospels, it shows that Christ himself moved among that layer of poor people, of prostitutes, of poor people, and so on. This was just, and, frequent, and frequently attacked the rich. It's not an accident that when he came into Jerusalem, shortly before he was arrested and crucified, that he, um, his first act, his first act was to drive the money, money changes out of the temple. You know, you have uh, polluted the house of my father, he said, yes, but you see, there in my other people, I said, temple of Jerusalem is not a church. It's a vast compound of wealthy people 
would have been full of soldiers and police and so on. You couldn't have done that. Jesus Christ couldn't just walk in and overturn the tables of the moneylenders unless he was at the head, head of an insurrection. And that's an interesting point. But uh, one of Christ's sayings, which is well known, he said that it's easier to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man into the kingdom of heaven. That's in Luke. There are many such expressions in the Bible. There are many things which shows, although they, they tried to repress it, in the, council, in the Council of Nicaea, which I'll deal with in a moment, they tried to purge the Bible, but they couldn't do this completely. They couldn't do it completely. For example, the book of James. Let me read chapters 5 to 6. Here we are. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rest of them shall be witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as if it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped your fields, which is, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Lord Sabaoth. Since when did the leaders of the Labour Party ever speak like that? I wish they would. That's real, uh, real hot stuff. And the communism of the early Christians is shown very clearly. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, this is evident by the fact that in their communities, uh, all wealth was held in common. The same as the Essenes. Anyone who wished to join the Christian movement at first to give up all of his or her worldly goods. I mean, we only ask for a very modest sum in this organization. Perhaps we should take it. A leaf out of their book. You've got to join this outfit, hand over all your worldly goods, and they did, including some rich people. Let's read from the Acts of the Apostles. This is interesting. This is a quote from the Acts of the Apostles. And they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine and fellowship, koinonia, that's to say, communism, and in the breaking of bread and prayers. They, they meet once a day to break bread, to eat, eat food together, and say prayers together. And all that believed were together and had all things common and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and, par and parted them to all men and every man, as every man had need to each according to his need. It's a principle of communism, isn't it? That's in Acts 2.42. So here you have a picture of the early revolutionary Christian uh, movement and by God it shook the authorities. It uh, succeeded like wildfire. Its message spread. Again I said to, to, the down, to the downtrodden people, not just in Judea, that's bad enough, but outside. Particularly to Rome itself, spread to the slaves in particular. And the early Christians, you've got to give them their due. You know, give them, it's very inspiring to read. The early Christians, they're prepared to endure the, the ghastliest tortures in defense of their faith, defying the state and the ruling class and perishing in the arena, eaten by lions and so on, by wild animals torn apart. And the reason for this ferocious persecution, by the way, was not religious at all. It was that this movement of the poor and dispossessed represented a threat, a growing threat to the existing social order. But you see, none of these, there were repeated waves of persecution, but they never, they didn't work. None of these methods succeeded in crushing the new movement, which in fact derived new strength from the blood of its martyrs. Now, nevertheless, the other side of the coin, <coughs> we must uh, be clear about this. Given the lack of a material base for the introduction of a class to society, gradually everything turns into its opposite. Under the prevailing material conditions, the leadership of the church, starting with the bishops, who were in fact the treasurers, you know that. The episcopos the tre was the treasurer. By the way, who was the first bishop, do you know? Most people would say Saint Peter, they'd be wrong. No, no, my friends. The first treasurer was Judas Iscariot. <laughs> he was he was the man that collected the subs. Not the first time that the treasurer ran off with the subs, you know. 
I'm not not looking at every, anyone in the room tonight, but there we are. It's, it's happened before now. Treasurer ran off with funds. That was the case with the Judas Iscariot. The treasurers, the peace book, the bishops became gradual. As the movement succeeded and grew and so on, they became div divorced from the rank and file. They rose above the class. You know, years ago, <coughs> I think I was about 14 years of age, I was a cautious youngster I was. I got hold of Gibbons, the marvelous book by Edward Gibbons, the great English 18th century historian, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. What a marvelous book. And I couldn't put it down. Six volumes, I read them all over the summer, sitting in the back garden in my brother's little chair. Decline and fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> Given by the was a man of the Enlightenment, and I'm sure he was an atheist. Couldn't stand. He particularly disliked the Christians and he blamed them, I think, for the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, maybe a slight exaggeration, but he had a point. But in one of his footnotes, I remember the footnote, I've got it here underlined somewhere. <laughs> he, he quotes the word of a bishop of one of the African bishops. Africa was part of the Roman Empire at the time. He quotes the, word, <laughs> the words of an African bishop. I'm speaking from memory now, but I think it's fairly accurate what I'm going to say. He said, my vows of, of uh, my vows of poverty have got me an annual income of a hundred thousand golden marks. My vows of obedience have set me above the heads of thousands of, of, of men, and so on and so forth. <laughs> and Gibbon adds at the end of this usual sarcastic tone, the worthy bishop does not go on to enlighten us as to what excesses his vows of chastity led him. Typical of, of Gibbon. But that's why they became gradually divorced and came under the pressure of the ruling class, of course. Now, the, the, the Roman ruling class, they'd failed. <laughs> All attempts to crush the movement by force failed. That's because the old society was already approaching its end. And realizing the impossibility of defeating the Christians by repression, the ruling class, as it always does, changed its tactics. And the way in which, instead of repression, you, get, you, you, you resort to corruption. And the way in which the upper layers of the church were corrupted by the Emperor Constantine, that gangster, can be seen very clearly in a passage which I've got here by an historian of the earlier church, a man that I cordially detest, but there we are, it's, a, it's an important source, Eusebius, who describes the Council of Nicaea in uh, AD 325, presided, and he says, presided over by the emperor himself, quote, like some messenger of God. Can you imagine it? These Christians have been repressed and slaughtered and tortured for centuries. Now these bishops troop into the emperor's palace, which I'll deal with that in a moment. And the first thing they see, the emperor himself is sitting there like some messenger of God, he says. Let's see what Eusebius describes this banquet. I quote, The circumstances of the banquet were splendid beyond description. There we are. <laughs> the circumstances of the banquet were splendid beyond description. Detachment of the bodyguards and other troops surrounded the entrance of the palace with drawn swords. Jesus Christ. Imagine, you've just been, these guys have been killing us for, 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 for forever. Now they've, they've blocked all the entrances, which they, they damn well did. <laughs> they were these withdrawn swords, and this is all right. Withdrawn swords, and he goes on. And through the midst of these, the men of God proceeded without fear into the innermost of the imperial apartments. Just imagine that. What a thrill. He goes on. Some of the emperor's own com companions at table. Others reclined on couches arranged on either side. How wonderful. And this is how he, this is how he said, this, is, this, this slide is priceless. One might have thought that it was a picture of Christ's kingdom and a dream rather than reality. Get a load of that, my friends. Get a load of that. Doesn't that completely sum up the entire psychology of the bloody 
labor bureaucrats and corrupt leaders for the last 2,000 years, I think it does rather well. And those methods are only too familiar to socialists and trade unionists today, aren't they? Precisely the same methods are used whereby the leaders of the trade union and labor movement are brought under the influence of bourgeois ideas and become corrupted and absorbed into the system. That's the name of the game. The tops of the movement are invited to, they, they, same as now, same, now same as then. What happens some guy who gets selected as a Labour MP, even a left-wing Labour MP, why not? First thing you do, invite him to your club. Come on, old boy, you uh, join my game, join the club, you know, and here are some shares. And invited to expensive dinners and parties where they rub shoulders with the rich and famous and they react in exactly the same way as that bastard you said just 2,000 years ago. You know, ever since the Council of Nicaea, the church, has become transformed into the firmest supporter of wealth, privilege, and oppression. Be sure of it. Be very sure of it. And of course, the gains to the empire and to the emperor of this sellout are palpable. If, for example, to look no further, the early Christians refused to recognize the emperor or the state or to serve in the army. That's serious. They refused the military service. Now all this was reversed overnight, suddenly. And the church became one of the main pillars of the state and ferociously persecuted anyone who called its new doctrines into question. For example, uh, when the emperor Theodosius, Theodosius, he was a particular bastard, came to, the, came to be the emperor in 381, heresy became a punishable offense. When Arius of Alexandria rejected the Nicene Creed, his supporters, the, known as the Arius, were immediately put to the sword. They were butchered. And over 3,000, immediately over 3,000 Christians were killed by their fellow Christians. A damn sight more than ever were killed in three centuries of Roman persecution. That's never mentioned nowadays. Oh, Nero's persecution, Diocletian's persecution. Nobody ever mentions the fact that far more Christians were killed by Christians than were ever killed by the Romans. It's a fact. By such means, which I've forgotten, no, no, you, you never see Hollywood epi epic films about that, do you? By such means did the church of the poor and oppressed become transformed into the principal vehicle for their enslavement. And the educated classes of Rome, of course, the wealthy people, the educated people, who never would have joined the church before, now they flock to it, of course, always join on the, on, on the, the winning side, of course. And they brought with them, of course, their traditional ideas and class outlook and all the philosophical baggage of paganism that infected Christianity and completely changed this character. It's a fact. It was Engels pointed that out. It's a man by the name of Bruno Bauer. Very intelligent man. He was a left Hegelian who specialized in his study of religion. He, he, he revealed this without a shadow of a doubt. He showed clearly that a large part of what passes for Christian do, uh, doctrine for, for the Bible and so on was pinched, was pinched literally, copied literally from the works of, of pagan philosophers like Seneca and, and, and Philo. That's an actual fact. Now, I don't know how much more time I've got. Not much, I think. I'd better draw my remarks to a close. You've got five minutes, Alan. Five minutes? <laughs> Wonderful. What can I say in five minutes? Well, let me see. First of all, I recommend you to read uh, Karl Kautsky's books, o book over Christmas. A assuming, of course, that you first re read and studied my history of philosophy. I mean, that goes without saying. Otherwise, we'll have you marked down as a heretic and persecuted. Um, the question is this, why did the Christians not succeed? Why did this marvelous revolution, it was really, a really heroic, you've got to give them their due, these poor, poor guys, you know, you've got to give, and women, heroic women. Why didn't they, they didn't succeed because they could not succeed under the prevailing Christians, they never could succeed. You see, Marxism explains that communism, socialism, if you like, must have a material basis. It depends on the attainment of a certain level of development of the productive forces. And the material conditions at that time, at the time of the early Christians, 
were not sufficient to, to permit such a development. Therefore, the communism of the early Christians remained on a primitive, on the most primitive level. It was the level really of what we call the level of communism of consumption. You know, you know, the sharing out, the sharing out of food, clothes, etc. And not real communism, which is based not on consumption, but on the collective ownership of the means of production is entirely different. And of course, lacking, lacking anything like a scientific understanding of the development of society, the earlier Christians, Christians despite their tremendous revolutionary spirit and heroism, were unable ultimately to realize their ideals, which inevitably had a fantastic and uh, visionary religious character, most clearly expressed as in the book of Re Revelations. Their communism was of a utopian character, which was doomed to fail. Ours is a scientific communism, which is destined to, su to succeed. You see, Marxism has an entirely different context, it's got a content, and has emerged, and furthermore has emerged at a time in history when all the material conditions of communism have already been created. When human beings become true human beings, they will no longer require the crutches of a superhuman, supernatural being, God, heaven, or anything of the sort. When men and women can perform miracles in real life, they no longer need the spiritual ghostly miracles described in the Bible. The blind can see, the deaf can hear, the lame can walk, even the dead sometimes can be raised by medical science in this day and age. And when we can perform miracles in real life, we do not require imaginary miracles. When we have created a paradise in this world, we will not need to be sustained by a dream about an imaginary paradise in the next one. 